Good morning, Hope Church. Are we alive and kicking this morning? I, I saw some alive and kicking people up here, and I thought there was some in the back too. I'm like, it's just, isn't it awesome to be part of a church where God is front and center, where Jesus is exalted? I'm, I'm telling you, in the world that we live in, please recognize that the church you're a part of is really laid it down for the sake of him. It's not about us, it's about him. And so I'm just super encouraged to be connected. I bring greetings from the Simpsonville campus from Greenville County. God's doing great stuff in Greenville County. He's doing great stuff in Spartanburg County. Um, And Simpsonville would not exist if it wasn't for your prayers and generosity. And the Greenville campus that is being built out as we speak again, would not happen if it was not for your prayers and generosity in Spartanburg, the prayers and generosity in Simpsonville, because I believe it's just the beginning of the more that God wants to do. So I just commend you for just your faithfulness in your heart. And if you're joining us online, we are just so excited to have you as well and to recognize that you're a part of a bigger family than we can imagine, right? And we can imagine. I wanted to ask, are there any elementary or middle school teachers that are here? Could you please stand? If you're elementary or middle school teachers, could you stand? And some of you might be parents that are also schooling your kids at home. I'd like for you to stand as well if that's the age group. Okay, this is for elementary and middle school teachers. This was a word that came from Wayne Drain at the Simpsonville campus. And I really felt that it was for you here in Spartanburg, too. It was just something that was on my heart. I'd like to read it. I just want you to receive it, okay? Just take it deep into your heart, and God can speak even more to it. But this is what was said. This was given, uh, was given to Wayne. Wayne just felt like a real download on September 7th of this year. And this is what the word is. I see a move of the Holy Spirit breaking out in grade schools and middle schools. I hear children praying and worshiping and crying out for their friends to be healed and saved. I see many getting baptized in water. And I don't know if you heard about what happened in Auburn in just the past couple weeks, but there was a gathering of 4,000 some students and there was such an urgency as different ones were coming to Christ that they walked out of the arena they were in and hundreds were literally baptized in a pond next door. So God's up to something here. The Holy Spirit would anoint teachers, parents and administrators to guard and to guide these kids, but not to lead. The Lord will use these kids to be catalysts and initiators. Guard them in prayer. Guide them with encouragement. Give them a father's and mother's nod of approval. Trust God to let this move go where it needs to go as the Holy Spirit leads and releases his destiny for their generation. I want you to receive that word. Just drink it. Drink it into your heart. I was just sensing this morning, this was for you here as well. And I just, I don't know, it's one of those things just to take it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it up here on the platform. If you want to grab a picture of it afterwards, you're free to do that. But I just felt like it was important for you guys to, to have that. But just receive it. Awesome. You may be seated. Come on. God's good. <laughs> Woo! And again, I I, I want you to understand, I mean, how many of you were part of the prophetic presbytery that happened last weekend? Were a lot of you? Okay. If you have not been a part of it, or you can go online and you can view it and just kind of see some of the download, just to to pick up on like, wow, God, you're you're speaking. Like, it's so clear. He's speaking today. And and that's why God's giving you how many ears? Hmm, Two ears, right? Because he wants you to hear his voice. And it's as real today as it was thousands of years ago. So I'm just going to encourage you to press in to all that God has. I'm going to kick it off this morning with another word that Wayne had for the church. This is for Hope Church. 
And I want you to drink this in as well. This is what he said. I heard it's time to cut the shoot and win the race. As I reflected on this, I had a picture of a race car approaching the finish line, pulling a drag chute behind it. A drag chute creates aerodynamic drag or air resistance designed to slow the race car down. It converts kinetic energy of wind, pushing in the opposite direction of velocity. Hope Church is like a race car right now with forward momentum. The devil's always trying to stop or at least slow down the work of God's people. A spiritual drag chute might be the enemy's attempt to frighten or intimidate us from completing the work we've been given. I feel Nehemiah has wisdom for you at this time. In Nehemiah 6.3, after the people had completed the walls, but before they finished the gates, Sanballat and Tobiah attempted to slow down their work. But Nehemiah led them to stay focused on the task at hand. He said, I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? God reveals the secret weapon his people have to carry on the work they've been given in Nehemiah 8.10. I want you to grab hold of this. Living a lifestyle of joy. The enemy cannot stand against it. Go home and prepare a feast, holiday food and drink, and share it with those who don't have anything. This is holy to God. Don't feel bad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So how do you cut the drag of the enemy's shoot? Here are the four things. Feel free to write these down. Clothe yourselves in the full armor of God so you can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Two, cut the shoots of whatever would drag or slow down the work you've been given. Stay focused on completing the work. Three, celebrate and share others. Isn't that so crucial in our days? You know, we're looking to, we always find ourselves wanting to celebrate ourselves and God, celebrate others, celebrate others of what God is doing. Share with others what God has done is doing among you. Four, choose to receive a fresh baptism of joy that heaven is pouring out. Keep reminding one another that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Finally, declare a season of joy to focus on prayer, worship, service, and encouragement. Experience the fullness of heaven's joy in his presence and be strengthened. So I think it's so important that we're reminded that God's given us these downloads. That's for the Hope Church body. Receive it. It's yours. Take it. Own it. So God's doing some amazing stuff. And, uh, you know, just, just to think back to where God has perhaps brought you from, some of the challenges, maybe of this year even, maybe as recently as last week or a month ago, God is wanting you to recognize that he is on the throne. And I'm gonna kick off today what we're titling Built for Battle. And it was really birthed out of this word that came forth. And Pastor Rich had unpacked on Vision Sunday a number of weeks ago about Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls, right? And I'll give you just a real quick background. Nehemiah had this burden, this, this feeling. He was in exile and he recognized that the, the walls around Jerusalem, there was, there was no fortification whatsoever and he had grieved his spirit. And so he comes into King Artaxerxes' presence, right? He's the cupbearer. He, he has prominence. He has influence. And King Artaxerxes looks at him and says, I've never seen you so so downcast. And so he shares the heart of what had been stirring in him. And he'd been in this place of prayer and, and really supplication of crying out to God. And it was in that place that King Artaxerxes recognizes that there's this burden that's on Nehemiah and releases him to go and be a part of rebuilding the walls. Okay. So that's what played out. Well, Nehemiah 4.1, we'll go there this morning. If you want to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build a wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, even remarked, that stone wall would collapse even if a fox walked along the top of it, right? You recognize that any time God opens a door for you or for myself, there is adversity. There are adversaries that have assembled, that have come together, that are gonna tell you about why you can't do it. You'll never succeed. There's not enough money. There's not enough of capacity. Your skill set is so mismatched and the list kind of goes on. Aren't those the kind of people you just love having in your life? I just love those kind of people. Please line up for me and just sing those praises, right? But that's what happens. You dream a dream and they're out to kill it, 
right out of the gates. You don't even get half the dream out and they're already cutting you off at the knees. They're sweeping your leg. They're looking for you to tap out. That's just what they're looking for, right? But the reality is, is that the Christian life, the Christian life is not like a battle. It is a battle. It's real. Second Timothy 2 says this. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlist him as a soldier. As a matter of fact, there's a quote by G.K. Chesterton. It says this, the Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because they are generally the same people. All right? You're like, oh man, you're... You're, you're preaching, you're preaching to me now. It's just, or, or you're messing with me or whatever it is, right? The, the reality is, is that we have been enlisted. If you have bowed the knee, if you've surrendered to the King of Kings, you've said, I am born again. I have accepted Jesus into my life, right? Then you are enlisted in his army. You are part of the army of God. Well, let me tell you something. The moment that that happens, there is a glowing target that is somewhere on your body. It might be all over your body, on your front, your back, your left thigh, whatever that looks like. And Satan's going, oh, have I got her number, right? Because Satan's out to kill, steal, and destroy. Now, we spend a lot of time fighting other people, arguing with other people, and all these dynamics. And Satan will use people as puppets to do his bidding. There's no question. But we get into it with them, don't we, right? The bottom line is it's not a natural battle. It's supernatural. And we spend so much time in the natural, we miss the supernatural. And you know what happens? Satan is just doing a high flyover going, I got him again. Oh, I got him again. Right? Time and time again. But that's not God's heart. He wants you to recognize first and foremost that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 12, right? And this is what's happening with Nehemiah. There's these four groups that have assembled, right? North, east, south, and west. And I won't go into all that, but there's all these groups that have assembled. And many of them are from the outside, right? There's, there's groups from the outside that are coming against Nehemiah. There's groups from the outside that are coming against you, right? But there's also the inside. Feelings perhaps of frustration, depression, right? Just like, what can I bring to the table? And there's this almost self-talk that we, that we find ourselves navigating because there's something going on in here too. It's like the Roman Empire. It never fell from without, it fell from within. And the, the danger for us from a within standpoint is that we could find ourselves kind of bearing or pushing down those things that we're struggling with, that self-talk, and it becomes the very cancer that takes us out. Because we're not submitting it to him. We're not surrendering it to him. So who was Nehemiah's real enemy? Well, let's talk about it. Lucifer, right? The archangel cast out of heaven, right? The devourer, right? The murderer, the thief, the god of this age, the dragon, the deceiver, the accuser, the list goes on, right? Like, let's make no mistake. The enemy is very real, right? However, somehow in America... we don't really think there is an enemy. We've been tricked. We've been sleight of hand, little smoke and mirrors. Now, there's enemies on the big screen. There's supernatural on the big screen. Plenty of Hollywood writers that are still on strike are writing about that, right? And we'll look at the big screen, but when it comes to our everyday lives or where we live, oh, listen, man. America, we, we don't have those challenges here. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to believe. It's exactly why he's the deceiver, right? But let me give you some good news. He's been defeated, guys and ladies. He's been defeated, right? Do you understand? He was cast out of heaven. When Jesus was nailed to that cross, by his stripes, you and I are healed, right? Do you understand? There's no power I mean, you think about even the story of Job. If you go to the very first chapter of Job and you realize the only power Satan had was to come present himself, right? God had to say, okay, yeah, we'll chat. And then Satan goes into this big thing about like, hey, I guarantee you that if you do this, this, and this, Job will curse you. So who gives Satan permission to come against Job? Satan? God did. He said, okay, you can do these things against Job, but don't take his life. Right? So who's running the show? 
right? I think we're going to be totally blown away when we find ourselves on the other side of eternity and we're going to recognize the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and we're going to be just in awe. We're going to be in awe of him, which is why I believe we're going to all be in those places prostrate, lied, laid down before him to saying, God, you are King, you are Lord. And then he's going to do, okay, guys, well, I want you guys to gaze behind door number three. Door number three is pipsqueak. And little pipsqueak is Lucifer. This is what you have been scared of. This is what you've allowed to run rampant. This is, this is him. And we're going to be like, that? F for real? But I, I thought he was, oh, that. See, God wants us to be in awe of him not the deceiver, right? First Peter 5, 8, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This is what's important to recognize, like, right? Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. You know what he is? He's a poser. He's a poser. He's a fake. You see how that works? He's a, he's a poser. But we give him so much credibility, like, we, like we, we find ourselves bowing down to him, to the God of this age, as if he, he's the one running the show. But he's a poser, like a lion. Now, I can tell you this, having grown up in West Africa and, and seen some lions fairly close, okay, right? I'm going to tell you what, there is a lion and there's like a lion. And when it's a lion, that like like a lion does not exist. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? You can go online and, and just, you know, do a little searches on real lines attacking real things. And I'm going to tell you what, you don't want to be the one getting attacked. But the poser, it's all smoke and mirrors, man. Smoke and mirrors. So this is where we're going if, we're, if you're going to be taking notes with me. We got four things we're going to touch on, four tactics for engaging in spiritual warfare, four tactics for engaging in spiritual warfare. And this is the key part of this. We need to be in a place of preparing for battle for war. It's about prepare, prepare, prepare. Just like in the real estate, location, location, location. God wants you to prepare, prepare, prepare. Okay. And that first place of preparation, that first tactic is put on the full armor of God, not the partial, the full. Okay. So we're going to jump into this real quick. Ephesians 6, 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day, not if, when the day of evil comes, okay, there is a win, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So let's unpack this real quickly. The belt of truth. They say during the Roman Empire days, a Roman soldier's belt would be somewhere between four to six inches in width, okay? And it was centered, of course, in the center section. And sometimes the Roman soldiers would tuck their tunic into it so they wouldn't trip over their tunic. It was also a place to carry their weaponry. And it was at the place of their core, so it was firmly attached because when you think about even when they were fighting and they were thrusting, there was this whole dynamic of using your hips or if they were guarding themselves, there was this importance of having the core solidified, right? It's that belt of truth. It's the center, right? So important. Then there's the breastplate of righteousness, right? This is your confidence in Christ. It's, it's that center part because recognize this. If the breastplate isn't in place, first of all, what does it cover? key organs, right? Your heart, lungs. I mean, list kind of goes on, right? So if this part of your body's exposed, man, not good, especially in battle. It's one thing if you're tanning on the beach for guys. Just had to clarify that. 
um, boots of peace, the gospel, good news that we can recognize, right? That God wants us to bring the gospel of peace. I, I've shared this with my girls ever since they were little. I've always said, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. And I've always prayed for their little feet. And now their feet are bigger because they're older ladies, right? And I pray for their feet that, that they would bring good news to many whether it's in Spartanburg, whether it's in Kentucky, whether it's somewhere else in the world, that God would do what only he can do. How about the shield of faith? They say the Roman shield was made of 13 layers of wood that were all interconnected. And it was literally somewhere between 22 to 25 pounds, right? But that shield was prominent and it was to take on the darts, right? The, the arrows that would come. And again, you might have everything else, but if you're missing that shield, right? That, that shield of faith, ooh. Again, you're exposed to the enemy. How about the helmet of salvation? That mind of Christ. For I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Then there's the sword of the spirit, right? The word of God, right? I mean, we gotta understand, like God gives us offensive weapons in this as well. How about prayer? It's an offensive weapon, right? And I'm reminded of this, like if you look at Nehemiah's life, you recognize that he was going to rebuild the walls, but he was going in equipped to do it, right? He'd done all the due diligence to get the proper, you know, releases on things, everything from timber to people he could take with him, even to have a, a, a group of soldiers that went with him to guard him on these paths. But his role was one of servant, governor, builder, soldier, leader, politician. I mean, he was like an all world, but the thing that set him apart, he was, he was a man of prayer. In Nehemiah alone, there's 14 different prayers that you'll see play out in the book of Nehemiah. When he approached the king, he prayed, right? When he was dealt with the, with the news of what was going on in Jerusalem, he prayed. When he faced opposition, what did he do? He prayed. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm guilty of doing everything else, and then I'll find myself, ugh, well, I guess we can pray, or I should pray, or whatever that is. Do you find yourself doing that sometimes, right? It's almost like a last resort. And, and I'm guilty of that for sure. And I, and I recognize that many times the reason that I find myself being guilty of that is because I'm putting so much more effort and I guess I would say this, not just effort, but weight into everything in the natural and not the supernatural. And I feel like the Lord's challenging me to move more into the supernatural. Like, Rich, pray first. Seek my face first. Go after me first, right? But I'll, I'll lean into my own understanding, right? And I'll go like, okay, I got this, I got this. And God will let us get it, right, for a while. And then he'll do this checkmate with you. And he'll be like, so let me know when you want to invite me into the equation. You know, just let me know. It's kind of like I joke with the Simpsonville campus sometimes. There's that song that came out a while back. Um, I think it was Carrie Underwood, and she goes, Jesus, just take the wheel, you know? Like, in other words, it's the whole premise of like, I got this, I got this. Whoa, whoa, I'm losing control. Jesus, take the wheel, help me, right? And how many times do we find ourselves in that boat, right? We come to the very last minute. We're getting ready to, to literally go off into the ravine, and then we're like, okay, God, well, you gotta save me now. We're all guilty of that. I know I am. But God is wanting us to recognize that he is king. As a matter of fact, over 300 times, it talks about Jehovah Sabaoth, which is really this whole premise that God is the commander in chief of heaven's armies, right? We can't even imagine what that looks like. You think of your context of empire, whether it's the Roman empire, or the Mongol empire, whatever it is, it doesn't even compare that he is the Lord of heaven's armies. Number two, prepare your mind. Second strategy, prepare your mind, right? We need to have the mind of Christ. Think about Romans 12, one and two, right? Being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Nehemiah 4, six says this, at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm. And this is what's crucial. And I didn't realize this, but the word enthusiasm comes from two Greek words, in and theos. It literally means full of God or full of the spirit of God. So when you think about the context of, wow, that's an enthusiastic group, or there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm in the room, right? 
It means there's a fullness of God. There's a fullness of the spirit of God. So I have been personally challenged to where sometimes you'll, get, you'll see somebody getting pretty fired up, right? Like different ones, maybe where it's an, it's an altar setting or a YX setting and people are just fired up and you almost kind of like, well, we probably should just tone this down, right? And I'm reminded like, it's like we're going to Jesus saying, Jesus, I need for you to kind of taper down a little bit. It's getting a little too crazy. Right? Just like it was getting a little too crazy with the Clemson Florida State game. <laughs> right? Or for South Carolina that thought it was all over and then they won, right? I put that shout out for the Gamecocks that are Gamecock fans. And then for those of you that are just Colorado fans, they got killed. <laughs> now, why do I bring that up? Because there's so much excitement at times and enthusiasm in those things, but we'll come into a setting like this and it's like, well, we probably should taper down right? Why is it that irregardless of most churches, right? The smallest attended meeting is the prayer meeting, right? And this isn't to condemn anybody, right? Because if I point a finger at you, there's four coming back at me, right? The reality is though, is that we should be men and women, young people, older people of prayer, but enthusiasm is a gift from God. Matter of fact, Haggai 1.14 puts it this way. So God had sent Haggai in to help encourage the people. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. They began to work on the house of their God, the Lord of heaven's armies. Number three, we need to be on guard when you and I are exhausted. What happens when you get tired? You're probably the nicest person, aren't you? You just chill. Nothing really bothers you. You know, you're tired. You're driving home from work. And that truck or that SUV or that little Miata or something just kind of gets in your lane and you're so chill because you're exhausted. And you're like, please take the full lane. Please just cut me off a little bit more. I love that. <laughs> no, you're not. You're like, there could be some fingers that shouldn't be showing up on your fingers. <laughs> For some of you guys, you just like to use the horn because that's like your gig. But there's some of you, it's the only time you ever use it. And there's other parts of you that if you could, and if your vehicle was set up just right, you'd like to almost like nudge them. Do you know what I mean? You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like Mad Max on wheels, right? <laughs> I'm going to push them right into that embankment. But of course, Jesus is flowing through you the whole time. I'm just killing him with the love of Jesus. This is so good, right? No way, right? It's why we have to be on guard because it's when I'm exhausted, when you're exhausted, isn't it amazing how enemy comes in, right? Sneaky little devil. And wants to get you off kilter, off center, right? And he's gonna, he'll do whatever he can to take you out. That's what it's about. Nehemiah 4.10, then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the walls by ourselves, right? There's this whole place of feeling defeated, right? They're tired, they're exhausted. I mean, it speaks clearly that they hadn't changed their clothes in days, right? You think about that, right? Maybe some of you, that's your gig, right? But I guarantee you they had you beat, guaranteed, right? I guarantee they didn't slow down for anything, right? Now, granted, they rebuilt a chunk of those walls in 52 days, and that's amazing, but they were physically exhausted. They were emotionally drained, and it's a perfect opportunity, right, for when we let our guard down, right, we get flanked. They come around the backside. They take us out, right? And it could be the people closest to you just because they recognize, hey, here's a point to take advantage of my spouse or my family or in the workplace, right? And our guard is down. This is where we have to be absolutely on mission to say, God, guard, guard me, right? Matter of fact, I was thinking about this with Elijah. Jezebel came after Elijah when? Do you remember when he came after him? Was it because he was all full and, you know, filled with the spirit and all that? It was when he was tired, when he was weak, when he was exhausted, right? That's when they came after him. Moses, the same thing. It was one of those things of where he even said, I can't carry this burden of all these people. And yeah, there was a lot of complaining and all this. He goes, I just can't carry it, right? 
He was weak, right? I mean, it was even where his father-in-law Jethro steps in and says, Moses, like, what the heck are you doing, man? You need to have people that are over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties to help you manage all these hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Thumbs up to the father-in-laws. Come on. Here are a couple things that's super, super important. This is where we need to recognize that we need, number one, we need to have a plan and practice it. We need to have a plan and practice it when it comes to finding yourself physically exhausted and emotionally drained. Number one, I believe, learn to say no. Just learn to say no, right? We, I don't care what anybody says. We are in a yes culture. Well, I don't want them to feel bad. I'm gonna say yes, and I'll say yes to this, and I'll say yes to that. And we do in the workplace. We take on another 40 hours a week on top of our 45-hour week workload, and we're just gonna be, we're gonna be Superman. Yeah, maybe there's a potential promotion if I work that much harder, but you're not that good. I'm not that good. Same in your family. There's gonna be things where you've gotta be able to look at your kids and say, you know what? Not today, honey. We're not gonna buy that today. We're not gonna entertain that today and we're not going to Dollywood again today, right? It's okay to say no, it's healthy. My wife is always telling me, Rich, just say no. But I like to say yes, I know, just say no, right? We need that in our life. Get control of your schedule, get some margin back in your life. Does the schedule control you or do you control the schedule? Can't answer that, you've gotta, you've gotta dig for that one. How about having a hobby? Something that you're like giving yourself to, right? It doesn't have to be something that's, you have to spend a ton of money to have some hobby. There are those, sure. But something that you can give yourself to that maybe is brainless, that's just like, I just love doing this and I get lost in it. Great, have something you can turn to, right? And then who do you have in your life that can keep you accountable on these things? I've always kind of defined accountability like this. Accountability is sharing in advance with someone, right? Hey, I'm struggling with finding a place of rest and inviting them in to that world instead of saying, yeah, well, I messed it up again. I'm exhausted again. I know I should have said no. That's confession. That's not accountability. Okay, accountability is you're sharing in advance, saying I'm potentially getting ready to walk into a very busy season in the marketplace and I, I, I really would appreciate if you could keep me accountable in these areas so I can have some healthy boundaries. And these are some boundaries I'm considering. Great. Number four, do not partner with fear. Do not partner with fear. Nehemiah 4.14, then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Think about that. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Are you fighting for family? Are you fighting for family? It's one of our values here at Hope Church. Are you fighting for family? Are you willing to stand in the gap? Because there's going to be times you're weary and someone's standing in the gap for you, right? Right? There's gonna be times you're gonna be the one that is in full strength, you're tracking, right? And you're gonna be able to stand in the gap for others. Powerful, powerful. See, fear and faith are both a choice. That's why it has to be faith over fear. You can make a choice. We made a choice in this country to embrace fear during the pandemic. We made a choice. Oh boy, Rich, now you're getting political. Oh no, we haven't gotten started there yet. I'm not saying there has not been people that have suffered because of what would be tagged COVID-19. I'm not saying that. But we allowed fear to drive everything. And I hate to say it, but some of the biggest culprits were churches. We'd gotten a call just a number of weeks ago from a leader in a, in a church group that was asking if we were gonna instate pandemic type protocols for the church just the past couple of weeks. And I'm going, how's that work? Really? Are we, are we gonna walk in faith? Or are we gonna walk in fear? And this is so much bigger than what happened in the pandemic, but if that's the deception that played out with the smoke and mirrors, what's potentially trying to knock down our doors next, right? You have to choose. Faith over fear. See, our culture is built on fear, fear of lack, right? 
fear of sickness, right? Fear of success in a lot of ways. Think about insurance companies. I mean, it, they're, it's built on fear. Well, I'm, there could be a Category 9 hurricane that's going to hit Spartanburg next week, right? Well, we can't cover it. FEMA's got you. Well, I'll tell you how that works out. I've been to Mayfield, Kentucky. I can tell you how that worked out. I can tell you how it worked out in other parts when I lived in Florida. You know what I'm saying? It's just challenge, right? But it's built on fear. The kingdom of God is built on faith. He wants you to walk in faith. He wants you to walk in the fullness of him. You're like, Rich, I hear what you're saying. My prayer is that you wouldn't hear what I'm saying, but you would hear what he's saying. Perfectly, Lord, speaking through me, but that you would be encouraged, that you would recognize that as you are in this place, even as Pastor Rich was talking about the equip courses, that you would find yourself equipped to be able to leave this facility, walk into a world that's in desperate need of what you have living and breathing in you, which is Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's a mission field outside of these four walls. And I was just sensing this morning that there's some of you that are under the sound of my voice or you're tuned in online, but you've never made that decision to bow the knee. You, you've never made that decision to truly surrender and put him first. It's why John 3, 16 is the most popular verse in scripture, right? For God so loved the world. That means he loved you. It means he loved me. That he gave his only son, his only son, not his fifth son, not his, his only son, that whoever would put their faith, their hope, their desires in him would not perish, would not die, but have everlasting life forever and ever and ever. I just believe that God wants to encounter you today. If you have never bowed the knee, you've truly never gotten low, right? Maybe your desire is you've always wanted to be all that, all world. God's allowed you to do some great things and you've got perhaps an incredible resume and you, you might even be in a place where you would be deemed very successful. But there's a God-sized whole heart right here. It's just a hole. And it, you've been filling it with so many things, but the one thing you've never filled it with was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If that's you today and you're like, Rich, I need Jesus in my life. I need to go low. I've done a lot of great things. I've done a lot of amazing things, but I've realized I've done them. I've never given glory to the King. And I want to submit my life. I want to walk into this place of freedom of laying my life down for Him. If that's you, would you stand? Say, Rich, I need Jesus. I'm in the gallery section. I'm in the lower level here. It wouldn't be right for me to rap today and not give you an opportunity to experience a Jesus that is madly in love with you. He sees you, your life matters. It's not by chance that you're here today. Perhaps you came in thinking, well, I'll go because I got invited or I'll just check it out. But God is wanting to meet you today. Is there anybody that would say, yeah, Rich, I need him. Anybody at all before I continue. I appreciate you standing, sir. It takes courage in a group like this. I see you though. God sees you. Anybody else? Maybe you're watching online and you're feeling stirred to do the same thing. I would encourage you to stand right where you're at, wherever you're watching us. Anybody else? Give you a couple seconds. Let's pray together. If you can just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I surrender all. I lay down my personal agendas, my personal desires, my hopes, my dreams. I submit them to you. Be the Lord of my life. You're my savior. You're my master. You're the lover of my soul. Have your way in my life. And everybody said, amen. Can we give it up for Jesus?
gone a little over. I have that tendency sometimes, forgive me. But I want to end with this. I was just really sensing that there's a number of you, perhaps under the sound of my voice, that have been dealing with just a spiritual attack. If I could just invite the ministry team up at this time. You've just been under a spiritual attack. You're not sure the, the hows, the whys, but it's been coming from all directions. And I, I just wanted to open up the altars that if you're feeling under a lot of attack and you maybe perhaps can't even put your finger on it and it just seems so out of control, the altar is open. These individuals, these ladies and gentlemen are here to love on you, to pray with you so that you can see that God has called you not to quit, but to walk in joy. This isn't the quitting time. This is not the days to call it we're all done. These are the days to press in like never before. So I'm going to pray. And as I pray, know that you are dismissed. But if there's a stirring, you're like, man, I just need a breakthrough. Like I'm being attacked from all sides. I just want to invite you forward. So Lord God, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. And for those Lord that are streaming us online, God, I just ask Lord God, that this would not be the quitting time. But Lord God, this would be the refire time. God, that you would set us up for success. Lord God, because we have chosen to go low. As we decrease, you increase. And Lord God, we come against the wiles of, this, of the enemy, Lord God, that is out to kill, steal, and destroy. But you have defeated Satan, hands down. He has no place in our lives. And we just give you glory and honor in your name. Amen. Man, again, the altars are open. I encourage you to come forward. Have an awesome, blessed Sunday.